Hey guys, it is CC Garland here. I hope you're having a great day. Today, we are going to talk about joint venturing, and I'm going to go over my exact process that I use to joint venture and what the structure looks like in my business. Also, I'll provide some benefits of joint venturing if you're starting off new or if you've been in real estate for a while and you've been wholesaling and you're looking to increase your deal flow. I'll give you some ideas and some tips on what you can do to scale up your whole system and business. So let's get started. Why do you want a joint venture? Why? Because a lot of people I mention this to, especially when they start off, they say, why would I want to cut somebody in a deal when I could just do it myself? Well, you may think that initially, and I hope you change that mindset really quickly because you're going to get to a point in your business where you're going to have to start cutting out percentages, whether it be to joint venture partners or cut out percentages to acquisitions team members or dispositions team members to get your deals to a close. So I hope you get to the level where you have to start outsourcing things and your percentage decreases. If your percentage is decreasing and you're doing more deals, ultimately your profit margin is going to increase. Right. So just because you're cutting other people in does not necessarily mean that you're losing out on money. You're growing. So please just think about things from that particular mindset and keep that in mind as we move forward, because I know that's a concern for a lot of people, especially if you're strapped for cash and you're just starting off. It can sting a little bit to do this, but there isn't a joint venture deal that I've closed and I've looked back on and said, man, I wish I wouldn't have cut. X, Y, and Z 50%. No, I'm really just happy and grateful for my percentage that I got in my bank account. And I can use that money to bring on other team members, other joint venture partners, or to put back in marketing. So we want a joint venture because all of us have strengths and all of us have weaknesses. What you're going to find out is as you do real estate, you're going to have some things you really like doing and excel at and some other things you just flat out hate, can't stand, and don't like doing. Now, when I first started, I thought I can do everything, and I thought I was going to like everything, and it ultimately just led to a whole bunch of burnout, and me essentially just throwing my hands up and going to South America for two weeks. That happened several years ago. I'll tell you guys a story about that later, <laughs> but you don't want to burn yourself out, and you want to make sure that you're able to essentially do a few things really good in the business because people naturally specialize as they move and progress in their real estate investing career. So we want to make sure we're honing in on the things we really, really like doing and we're really good at. That's not to say that there's going to be things that you don't enjoy doing that you're just going to be able to avoid all the time. I'm not saying that, but if you're waking up every day and you're just gritting your teeth about doing a particular task, you might want to look at outsourcing that part to a call center, to somebody in the Philippines, or just bringing on a virtual assistant, or bringing on somebody who can specialize in that thing that you're weak at. I found that doing joint ventures can also get you out of your nine to five job a lot quicker than if you're just doing this alone. Because let's just say you're only able to dedicate 20 hours out of the week to wholesaling. Well, if you bring on another joint venture partner who could bring in 20 hours out of his week or her week, then you essentially have a full time career there. Each person is giving 20 hours and you're really able to see a lot of damage being done in a good way in your businesses. So it'll get you out of your job a lot quicker and you won't find yourself really being weighed down and bogged down by things. That, uh, that you can't really get to and overwhelmed. I'm telling you, it's the best feeling whenever you're working a full-time job and there are some things you have to do and your partner says, don't worry, I've already got that. I've got that taken care of. It's a sigh of relief and I'm telling you, it gives you that much more motivation just to go out there and do some more deals. So keep that in mind. That's a big, big part of why you would want a joint venture. Especially, I know a lot of you guys and gals are working full-time jobs. One main reason why I like joint venturing, 
and I suggest you guys look at joint venturing is because you can basically go into any market and virtually wholesale. So I'm in about 10 markets right now in six or seven states, and I have a joint venture partner who's actually handling all of the acquisitions in every single market. And later on in the video, I'll actually discuss the agreement and the structure that we have. It's a really great agreement for both parties. It's mutually beneficial, but you can virtually wholesale and you can wholesale anywhere by joint venturing with somebody who may be your boots on the ground. So we'll go ahead and in the video later, talk about the different structures and how you can make this happen and work and it be advantageous to everybody involved. So we already touched on the benefits of joint venturing a little bit, but a really big point to note is that you have less liability legally if you're joint venturing. So you don't have to worry about a lot of paperwork that's needed between two partners. Setting up a bank account or registering your LLC with the Secretary of State, that's done just with you at that point if you have your own LLC. If you bring on somebody else who's actually a partner, then you know, you're gonna have to wait on them to do a lot of these things. Basically, you can move at your own pace. So that's why I really like joint venturing. And also, you don't have to worry about training a team on everything. So let's just say you're responsible for the marketing. You just train your guys on the marketing. If your joint venture partner, like in a lot of my markets, is responsible for the acquisitions, hey, he handles everything acquisitions related. If he has some questions or whatever, I'm not the guy to ask. He has to figure that out on his own. He handles all of his expenses because if he wants to outsource his acquisitions, that has to come out of his 50% cut out of every deal. You basically are just responsible for your little island. So you're just responsible for handling things that are on your turf, which I love. Uh, it, it reduces overwhelm and it really provides a lot of clarity because you're only focusing on the things you want to focus on and the things that you really like doing. Let's talk about joint ventures versus partnerships. Partnerships have two or more individuals underneath the same LLC. So like I just mentioned, with a partnership, it's usually going to be two people and they'll have XYZ Homebuyers LLC. Well, both of you guys have to sign off on the paperwork for the Secretary of State, for the EIN. You have to file your taxes together. You have to sign off on everything together if it relates to any sort of banking information. Say you want to change the contact information or you want to change what type of bank account you have. You have to both be in agreement on that. And it just causes a lot of friction over the years. Now, I would tell you when you first start, things are great. But as you start to scale up, especially if you don't really know yourself that well, meaning knowing your personality type and knowing the other person's personality type, then some things start to reveal itself to you. And you say, well, this isn't the person that I thought I was going into partnership with. But look, there's nothing wrong with that because people grow over time. So it's best just to start off with a joint venture if two people are working together in the same market or in virtual markets, because it's that much easier to break ties if things just go south. And all the partnerships I've been a part of or I've seen, I wouldn't say they've gone south. I would just say it's been a mutual separation. Really, it gets to the point where I look back and I said, I should have just joint ventured from the start. So that's my two cents on that. I could go on and on about joint ventures and all the benefits. So let's go over a few. So joint ventures are actually a partnership between two or more companies. Usually in real estate, it's going to be between two companies. One company is going to be responsible for one thing and another company is going to be responsible for another set of tasks. Now, it works great because they can be short term or long term. So if I'm bringing on a joint venture partner, I may bring them on for three months or for a deal or two, and we see how the partnership works. If I don't like what I see, 
then I could easily part ways. There's no harm, no foul. That's a mutual understanding from the start. So you also have less stress because you're only worrying about things on your turf. You're only worrying about the things that you're responsible for and you're running your business how you want. And then there's no exclusivity either. So say I want to go and get 10 joint venture partners in Charlotte, North Carolina. I can. I can write that up in my joint venture agreement. Say I'm bringing all the skills to the table marketing wise and I have a whole bunch of people I'm unsure are going to work out. I may bring on 10 joint venture partners and just round robin the leads and say, okay, today joint venture partner one gets 10 leads. Tomorrow, joint venture partner two gets 10 leads. And over the course of three months, I may see who actually closed deals and I may keep that person or a handful of people on. So it's really at your discretion. You are setting the terms in the joint venture and you're determining how fast you want to move or how slow you want to move. You're not really answering to anybody. So all egos stay intact. I know entrepreneurs love, love, love running their own businesses and they cannot stand if somebody is telling them what to do. I know in my personal business, I want to run things my way. I have my own leadership style that may not jive with a lot of other people's leadership styles. That's great because I'm only worried about my turf and my backyard. Whatever my joint venture partner does, it's whatever. Long as the deals are getting closed, long as my wires are hitting on time, long as properties are being contracted, he could be doing whatever. He could outsource whatever. But when it comes to a partnership, there is more oversight because everything's on the table. Two partners see everything that's going on. So my joint venture partner, it may be a train wreck on his end and he may not really be touching the leads how I want, but I may see that things are getting done so I don't say anything. It's like the phrase out of sight, out of mind. If I'm not seeing something, then it's not at the forefront of my mind. But if I'm seeing the leads getting touched, deals are getting closed, great. Do whatever. Run your business the way you want to run it. So who should joint venture? I suggest having a little bit of experience underneath your belt if you're going to joint venture because you're going to need to bring something to the table. Now, new investors can do this if they're working full-time jobs, but I don't suggest two new investors to joint venture. It's like the blind leading the blind at that point. If you're looking just to hang on somebody's coattails, then this isn't for you. In my joint ventures, everybody has to pull their own weight. I do not bring on anybody where I'm training, coaching, or teaching. Absolutely not. You're expected to come in and perform day one. There's no teaching. There's no CC. I need to know how to do this. No. And honestly, we don't even get to the point where we're joint venturing because we hash that out beforehand. So if I have a call with a joint venture partner or a potential joint venture partner, then we will ask all these questions. But I realize not everybody is at that level. So in a little bit, I'm going to actually show you how you can provide value, even if you're a beginner. So just hang on for a little bit and we will go over that. Now, you also would like to joint venture if you're looking to scale. It gets to a point in your business where you have a choice to make. For me personally, it got to about 10 deals a month. And I realized I had to scale up and either bring on more people and train them or find some joint venture partners to work with. So you can either start hiring people, team members to handle your acquisitions, to handle your dispositions, to handle your cold calling, your marketing, or what you can do is find a joint venture partner that will handle all of this for you. Either way, you're going to have to give up some percentages. Now, in my particular business, I probably am giving up a little bit more profit than I would if I actually trained a lot of people underneath my own company. However, that's stressful and that's something I don't personally want to do or like doing. Why? Because I know my personality type. I'm an introvert and I don't really want to be involved with training people and keeping up with them. 
honestly, I'm not saying I don't enjoy people, but I'm not very organized when it comes to that. And I'll admit that I'm not good with maintaining a team. I'm a lot better with integrating people in a system that do things really well and putting them in place based on their personality types. I've been talking about personality types a lot, and I really believe in that. So I hope you will take this next part seriously because I wish I knew this before I started. It would have saved me a lot of time, effort, and heartache. When you're structuring a joint venture, you're going to want to decide who's responsible for what. Now, there is no specific standard on saying, this is how you structure a joint venture. You can be as creative as you want, as long as it's beneficial for both parties. You want to just make sure that both people are fine with it. If the only thing that you're doing is just providing money to the marketing or to run business expenses and your joint venture partner is doing everything else and it's fine with both of you all, that's great. Do it. You know, there's nothing saying that you have to have a joint venture partner where it's, I would say the time is equally uh, distributed, right? And I'll discuss in my joint venture structure, it's not necessarily like that. What's happening is we're bringing equal value. So for me personally, in my joint ventures, I'm bringing the knowledge value. While I might not be giving the same amount of time, my knowledge and experience is fueling the joint venture while my joint venture partner is giving his time because he doesn't necessarily have all of the tools and resources like I have to generate the marketing or to get the deals to close. I'm not saying that he doesn't bring anything to the table. He is insanely intelligent and responsible and autonomous. He's amazing. But all I'm saying is that with the value I'm bringing, it outweighs the time I have to put in. So with both of us, it balances out and we have a mutual understanding in that regard. With the personality types, I strongly suggest you taking a personality type at 16personalities.com. This is a free test and is based on the Myers-Briggs 16 personalities model. If you've taken that test before in grade school, I highly suggest you take this one because there aren't a lot of questions and it's highly accurate. It took me about 20 to 30 minutes to take, and it was really eye-opening. At the end of the test, they actually say what task you should be doing in what particular job, right? So say you're an extrovert, and your extrovert personality type is more catered towards being um, a caregiver, then they may suggest, well, you should pursue something in the nursing field. With me, I am an INTP, so I'll type that right here. So basically, uh, I'm more of like an analyst, which actually makes a lot of sense because when I look back on my life in the military, I worked in military intelligence, and guess what I was? An intelligence analyst. I did not deliberately go out and choose that job. It was just one of many that was open at the time whenever I enlisted in the military. However, I love that job so much. Why? Because it was perfectly in line with my personality type. So I really suggest you taking a personality type test and finding out what you really do well and what you enjoy doing and applying that to real estate. Guys, when I first started, I thought I had to do everything. And because I wasn't good at some things like cold calling or door knocking or anything extroverted like networking with buyers. I felt like I was inadequate as an investor. I felt like I was a fraud, to be honest, because I kept on telling myself the only thing I do is just sit on the computer and run the marketing. You know, I don't enjoy going to seller appointments. I don't enjoy talking on the phone from sun up to sundown. Who am I to call myself an investor? Guys, please don't take that mentality. I've really, really debated continuing investing because I felt like I didn't have the skills at one point to be successful at it because I wasn't a natural at certain things. There are so many different aspects to just wholesaling. You can't possibly be great at everything. You can't. And once I told myself that, and once I truly believed that I could do 
one thing or a few things really well, and it was needed, I really felt like I belonged. So if you're an introvert like me and you just hate the idea of cold calling, you just hate the idea of door knocking, you hate the idea of meeting with buyers and, and putting yourself out there. And it's a true like dislike. You truly don't like it. I suggest you find a joint venture partner that loves doing those things and having them do those things and you specialize in the things that you're great at. It could be the opposite. I know Ethan, whenever we first started, he hated anything computer related. I mean, I was trying to get him to use Podio for a year and he would just keep his notes on a pen and pad and I would just pull my hair out because nothing was organized. But as soon as he committed to using Podio and I made the process in Podio work really well, guess what? We saw our lead flow not only become more consistent, but almost triple. So think about that, guys. Every part of wholesaling is important. Just because you're not out here knocking on doors and negotiating deals with sellers does not make you less of an investor. Just because you're going out and talking to sellers and you hate anything computer related and you don't like dealing with the transactions doesn't make you less of an investor. You're just doing one part of the business that you like really well. So guys, I suggest, highly suggest you taking a personality test and seeing where you fit in. You may say, well, I already know I'm an introvert. Well, take this test and they will tell you the specific type of introvert or extrovert you are and how to best utilize your skills in the career field that you want to pursue. Very eye-opening stuff. So we are going to go over our joint venture structures now. Keep in mind that when you structure these, you are going to want to make sure it's like a yin and yang. Meaning, uh, I don't know if you know what the yin and yang is. Uh, it's like this Chinese symbol, which basically means um, dualism, right? So it's describing how seemingly op opposite or contrary forces may actually be complementary. So basically that old phrase that you've heard, opposites attract. You want somebody who complements your strengths and weaknesses. If somebody is great at being behind the computer and you love being out talking to sellers, you're going to want to get somebody that complements your skill sets. Don't go out there and find somebody that loves going out and talking to sellers just like you and nobody's doing the computer stuff. So to break it down, I would just say find somebody that loves talking to people and dealing with them and find somebody that loves being on the computer. And if you have two of those types of people, then it's going to be a really easy fit for you. And the joint venture is going to work. Here's a couple of ways you can structure a joint venture. Remember, everybody needs to bring the value to the table. Whether you're bringing money or your time, it has got to be mutually beneficial. This isn't a mentor slash student role that we're playing here. This is two people that are equal. Now, while one person's experience may be way ahead of somebody else's, they may have more years in real estate. For instance, in most of my joint venture partnerships, I have way more experience. However, that doesn't mean I devalue my joint venture partners any less. It's quite the opposite. They're doing something that I know from experience and all of the years that I've been in real estate wholesaling that they can do some tasks a lot better than I can. Here's one way to structure it. You can handle the marketing, dispositions, meaning you're moving the properties that you have under contract to buyers, and the transaction coordination. While your joint venture partner is solely focused on contracting the properties, meaning they're the acquisitions guy. So what you could do is actually split up the marketing costs up front. So say both of you guys want to target a virtual market and neither of you guys have dedicated any resources in that market. What you could do is actually split the marketing costs up front or whoever is handling the marketing come out of pocket all for it. And when you guys close your first deal, you just compensate yourself. So say you come up out of pocket for $2,000 for marketing costs. 
at closing, if you make 10K, you just take the 2,000 out, compensate yourself, and then split up the rest equally. Here's the second structure you can do. You can actually handle the acquisitions and your partner handles the marketing while you bring in an agent to list your properties and do all of the transaction coordination. So with this one, you're the extrovert and you're talking to all the leads and your partner is handling the marketing. Say they're the computer guy and you actually bring in a third party once you have a deal contracted and they're moving the properties. So say neither of you guys have buyers or you don't want to deal with buyers, just cut somebody else in. They won't be part of the joint venture partnership, but you can pay them per deal or have a marketing consulting agreement with them. I've seen a lot of people be successful doing this. And this actually helps too if both of you guys are working a full-time job. I'm telling you, if you could just focus on one thing and your partner could focus on one thing, and then as soon as you get a deal, you don't even have to worry about it being moved and you don't have to worry about your assignment fee, that could take so much stress off of your plate. Let's talk about my absolute favorite joint venture structure. And this is the structure I have right now, which allows me to basically outsource all of my business. I'm only handling the marketing. My joint venture partner is calling the leads, he's viewing the properties, he's contracting the deals, as well as handling dispositions and transaction coordination. So you may say, CC, I will never find somebody to agree to this. You don't know. Why am I able to do this? Because I am an expert at marketing. One thing that I notice in the real estate investment space, wholesaling, rehabbing, landlording, is there is an immense lack of leads. Most of the investors right now are getting deals off the MLS. I'm telling you, I just picked up a joint venture partner yesterday and he said he's getting all of his deals for 85 cents on a dollar off the MLS, and he's happy about that. I said, wow, if you're happy about that, you're gonna be blown away when we start sending you leads. So the value that I'm bringing is immense. There's way more people out there that can contract properties and talk to sellers than could generate quality leads. I'm telling you that. There are way more people out there that will talk to sellers and contract deals, then they know how to generate leads. There is a shortage out there. You have multimillionaire investors out there that can rehab a property, that can list it on the MLS, they can make 100, 200,000 on a flip, but if you start asking them to generate off-market leads, they don't even know where to start. So I suggest if you're new, specialize in marketing. Watch all of my videos. I give away the game for free. I'm showing you exactly what to do. You can pick up a JV partner that's rehabbing, that's saying, okay, I'd much rather pay you a certain amount of dollars to handle my marketing than me having to compete at auctions or on the MLS. If you're able to position yourself correctly, and if you're able to position yourself in a way where the rehabber is confident in you, then you can change your life really quickly, especially being a newbie. I will give you guys an example of when Ethan and I first started. If you're new, please don't be discouraged because I will tell you something right now and it will hopefully change how you are viewing yourself and your positioning if you're new. So we started working with a developer. We were probably six months into our investing careers and we started working with a developer that was looking to develop a large part of Charleston. Now, he heard about us because we were out here moving and shaking in the streets. We were contracting properties. We were networking with the homeowners in this particular area. And we actually wholesaled a few lots to him. They were vacant lots. And so there was a particular neighborhood he wanted to target. And we were contracting deals left and right. So he brought us into his office, downtown Charleston. And let me tell you, this was one of the biggest developers in Charleston. He had a line of realtors just waiting to work with them, even to be unpaid interns. And he looked at us and he said, I want you guys to do the marketing for me in this particular area. How much is it going to cost for me to hire you guys? And this 
is literally about six to seven months in our investing career. Ethan and I, we were sort of shaking in our boots, but he wouldn't have known that. We definitely carried ourselves well, but just the fact that we were there and we just started, it was, it was mind blowing when we look back on the whole situation. So it's all about the value you can provide. Remember that. It doesn't have anything to do with how long you've been in the game or experience. You want to make sure you're providing something that nobody else can get anywhere. You need to make sure that your joint venture partner, if you're going to go with any of these sort of structures, is autonomous, trustworthy, and experienced. If you're inexperienced and you're bringing in somebody who's equally as inexperienced, the joint venture partner may not work out well because you guys are just learning this thing together. Now, it may help having somebody there to motivate you and all of that. I get it, but you're going to be spinning your wheels and you most likely are going to get dragged down by that other person or you may drag that other person down. So I highly suggest you having a couple of deals underneath your belt before you present yourself to a joint venture partner because you don't want to go out here and essentially ask a whole bunch of newbie questions. That's a really quick way to diminish your value. As soon as you lose credibility, you can't gain it back. So let's talk about the pay structure. I split my assignment fees 50-50 with other wholesalers that I'm working with. If I'm working with a rehabber, like in San Francisco, it may be 20, 30% of the total profit once the property is rehabbed. However, I do make my investors pay for marketing costs. The marketing costs have got to get covered. So I always split it 50-50. You want to make sure that it's advantageous and it's beneficial for both parties. Don't offer somebody 20 to 30% if they're going to be bringing in 50% of value. Pay them what their value is. Like I said earlier, I've never closed a deal and looked and saw how much my joint venture partner was making and was frustrated about that because I looked at it like a team. We got this thing closed ourselves and both parties brought equal value to the table. It's a true win-win. That's why I love, love, love joint ventures. Now, what you're going to want to do is actually sign a joint venture agreement. I typically specify all of the roles beforehand. So I'll hop on a video call with my partner and I'll basically lay out what I'm responsible for, what he's responsible for. Then we'll type up a joint venture agreement. You could go to lawdepot.com and there's a generic joint venture agreement there that's about 12 pages and you just fill in the blank. So guys, add some final remarks. Remember, you shouldn't have to teach your joint venture partner anything and they shouldn't have to teach you anything. This isn't a mentor student relationship, right? So while you can learn some things from each other, you need to specialize in one thing and bring that to the table for the joint venture truly to make sense. I've seen a lot of people online ask if people want a joint venture, but they're not saying the value they're providing. You have to provide value for it to be a valuable joint venture for both parties. So just remember that you always want to be bringing somebody in with experience and you want to have some experience and you want to make sure that the experiences that you guys have complement each other. If your partner is good at marketing, you better be experienced with talking to sellers. If you're good with dealing with buyers, your partner has to be good with transactions coordination. So there's very little overlap in a true joint venture agreement. And those are the ones I found work the best. When they start falling apart is when the other joint venture partner starts asking the other joint venture partner to do some things that weren't really specified in the agreement. And in those particular cases, I suggest to dissolve it and find somebody else. Because once you provide value and you know how to provide value, you can basically offer your services to a lot of people out there that may need it. But you just have to find them. I highly suggest specializing in marketing because this is something that's not really known a lot by investors, especially with rehabbers. So if you specialize in the marketing and you say you can get 
your rehabber a whole bunch of leads, he's going to want to work with you because he doesn't know anything about doing that. He could work leads, but he just needs some leads to work. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is going to be the first video of probably a multi-part series of joint venturing and virtual wholesaling. They go hand in hand. I wanted to provide an overview of how we actually joint venture before we went into the process of virtually wholesaling because this is the foundation of it. It's important to know how to do this part well before you go off and start getting joint venture partners and generating leads and working deals. So please let me know if you have any questions. It's been a pleasure talking to everybody in the Facebook group. If you're on YouTube, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. I really hope you're having a great day and I will talk to you guys later.